Hey folks, Todd Colburn with your Aerospace Structure Series. This lecture is on fasteners and it's on fatigue of preloaded tension joints. All right, so last lecture, lecture 12, we saw how to evaluate bolt stiffness. We followed the approach where we got the shank area, we calculated the, uh, we looked up the thread area, we calculate a, a spring constant for both the shank and the thread using the effective length of each from face of the head to face of the nut. We then put these two together with a simple spring formula to get the effective stiffness of the bolt. We then went and looked at the member stiffness. We learned how to fan our load out from underneath the bolt head, or in our case for arrow 3271, from underneath the washer, which generally can be done in industry as long as the washer isn't a whole lot larger than the bolt head and it's not really thin. With that approach, and also I recommended a 45 degree cone angle, which keeps your analysis simple and direct and, uh, and is sufficient for most work in industry. This means we're idealizing our members as a bunch of little cylinders. Even though that's not strictly correct, it's approximate and it'll do a fair job, a fairly good job of approximating that bolt stiffness without testing. Okay, so for this joint, we have two washers and two members, so we come up with four stiffnesses. Each For each stiffness, we're first going to have to calculate the effective diameter of that member for the washer is just the outer diameter minus the inner diameter for the uh well actually the effective diameter is, is the cylinder is just going to be the full um, washer from outer to inner diameter but for all other members between the two washers we're going to fan that load out we're first going to find out what the effective diameter is at the mid plane of each plate or each member that's tied together using this formula then we're going to calculate the area, making sure we subtract out the hole, and then we get the spring constant for each element, and then we calculate our effective stiffnesses. You can just imagine that that little ki is a little bit further down. I'll fix that after I'm done recording. Okay, our member stiffnesses. Uh, we first calculate our member stiffness coefficient, uh, which we calculated like this. Once we have the bolt and member stiffnesses, we use those to estimate the, uh, the load after external load is applied, what the force in the members are. We evaluated where that was tension or compressive. If that's compressive, then that C is valid, and we calculated the bolt force. If not, then we had to put all of the force, both the preload and all external load, into the bolt. Okay, now that's all just a review of what we saw last lecture. Now, moving on into fatigue, we're going to actually build on what we did in fatigue earlier in the series. We're going to be looking at cyclic load that's oscillating from some maximum value to some minimum value. So whether we're looking at the stress oscillating or whether we're looking at the force oscillating, we can evaluate it either way. Let's just say we're looking at the force oscillating from max to min. In that case, the force bolt is a max and a min value that we calculate like this. So this is once again assuming that that joint stays compressed uh, under the external load. Okay, our mean and our alternating stresses are calculated the same way as before. Our alternating component is F max minus F min over 2. This means if we plug in the bolt force, right, P over A, you can write it like this. And uh, we can simplify that down to this final equation. The alternating stress is simply C times P max minus P min over 2AT. Okay, We can do the same thing for the mean stress, which is going to be written like this and can be simplified like that. These are our two equations that we'll be using for evaluating most bolts. Okay, Now you'll notice there's no K sub T in here. We put a stress concentration factor on our fatigue work before. But with bolts, it's pretty common to go and bury the stress concentration factors since they're pretty common. 
where what where they occur and what they are. So we'll go ahead and bury those in our endurance limit. We did not do that before for fatigue, but we're going to do that for bolts. Okay. So then uh, before we move on, let's take a look at where failures occur. Failures in a bolt occurs in three places. Right in the fillet underneath the head, at the first thread, and at the first contact in the thread at the first contact with the nut. So let's think about that a little bit. Imagine that bolt. It's under tension, right? So the shank has a certain area, and then at the threads, you have a varying area. You're going to have a stress due to the reduction in area at the threads. You're going to have a stress concentration factor. So we're going to expect to see failures there, okay? The shank is a larger diameter, and often there's a fillet going from the uh, shank to the head. Because of that fillet, you're thinking, wait a minute, I got a larger diameter, and I have a fillet. This should be not critical. However, imagine when that bolt is in. Imagine the bolt head, when it's sitting in the hole, it's like it's got, like you just fell through the ice and you're sitting there with your body down in the cold water and your arms are still, your elbows are still propped on the ice and as the waters, let's say a shark is pulling you down as he does, he's pulling you into the ice and it's pulling your, so it's working right under here, even though it's a larger dam and there's a fillet, it's being worked with tension as that's bending off, bending off, bending off each time it's loaded. This is why the fillet is one of the places where this happens. Now, the, when the bolt is in tension, it's going to be the full bolt is going to see that full tension all the way from right underneath the bolt head all the way down until it starts coming out in the nut. So actually you've got the same force. Your stress is going to be higher once you hit those threads. And you're going to have a stress concentration at the thread. So the first place where you get that abrupt change in load without before a lot of the load is readjusted down within the smaller portion that's not cut away by the threads will be at the first thread. So that's a very common place for uh, failures to occur is at that first thread where the first abrupt changes. The third place is at the contact with the nut. So once the stress gets kind of neck down, the bolt was a shank diameter, and then it, it goes down, it keeps going down to the minor diameter and the major diameter, which means once it goes through the first thread, the load's already adjusted a little bit, and so it won't be quite as critical until it gets down to the nut. Now, when it hits the nut, the thread is actually being held on the nut in the same way as we did with the elbows of the head, but now it's pulling on the thread. So actually that last thread or the first thread where the nut is engaged, it's actually working that thread. Now, uh, if we look at the relative, so that's the third place. If we look at the failure, relative failures, uh, about 15% fail into the head. Remember, we've got a larger diameter and there's a fillet. Therefore, that's gonna, both those things are gonna minimize when that occurs, but it does happen about 50% of the time. Okay, 20% at the end of the thread, that's right where the, the stress riser gets largest, uh, is where the first stress riser occurs at that first thread, 20% occurs there. Now, that actually would be more critical than down there at the first contact with the nut uh, because of the change, the abrupt change. But remember, all that sees is just the tension. At the nut, you see that thread, that last thread is the first one grabbed, the last thread, or the first thread that engages with the nut, or the last thread before it engages, is engaged with the nut, and that means that the nut is pulling that thread open, pulling that thread open, pulling that thread open, and you still have the full, full force in the thing. Once you get in that first thread, you start dropping load, so load quickly goes from the full tension to nothing by the time you get to the other side of the nut. So it's that first thread contact, that's where most of the failures happen, about 65-ish percent according to Shiggy. Okay. All right, so with that understood, we're ready. Uh, we now have our mean and alternating force, and we're ready to go and evaluate fatigue. As we did before, we're first going to select a failure criterion. These are three of the common failure criterion we might use. The Goodman, Gerber, and ASME elliptic. And we also see the failure line drawn on here. Now you'll notice there's one thing different about this curve than what we saw before. 
before we plotted our point, our mean and our alternating stress, we drew a line from the origin through the point and down and on through the failure curve, and we wrote our margin of safety due to the relative lengths. But in this case, you'll notice that our failure line is not coming from zero. It's coming from the preload. This particular bolt is preloaded, it looks like about 90 KSI. Uh, that says PSI, but that's a typo, that's KSI, so about 90 KSI. And, uh, and at 90 KSI, because it, it, the load in the bolt doesn't go less than 90 KSI, right? It doesn't take compression, it's just taking tension or nothing. And it already has that preload in it, so it's going from preload to some value, preload to some value. So we're going from that preloaded value through the point where FMFA is plotted and on through the failure curve when we write our margin of safety on the relative lengths. But we're not going to have to write our margin of safety on the relative lengths because I'm going to give you a closed form equation on the next slide. Okay, so if we this is our failure curves. Our Goodman criteria, if we simplify, uh, plug in the differences with starting at the preload versus starting at zero, we'll get this equation for the margin of safety for the Goodman criteria. SUT is just FTU in this equation. S sub E is the endurance limit. And FI is the preload, FM stress, and FM is the mean stress, FA is the alternating stress. Okay? If we use the Gerber criteria, we get this form of the equation, and the symbol is the same. You'll notice here, I changed out instead of SUT, that's FTU. Actually, you can change out those SUTs with FTU in that first equation as well. Uh, SUT is Shigley notation, and FTU is more common in aerospace. All right? Uh, and if we use ASME elliptic, then we're going to get a similar equation. However, now you'll notice there's another variable, S sub P. This is the proportional limit allowable. So if you look up that uh, proof strength or proportional limit in, the, in your bolt tables and use that ASME elliptic looking for no yield, instead of using FTY, it uses the proof load or the proof stress uh, or the proportional limit stress, which is that capital F sub P or capital S sub P. Okay, everything else is the same. There are two other, so this is how we evaluate. If we show positive margin of safety, zero or better, that means that that bolt should last forever and ever. Hallelujah. If we show negative margin of safety, all that means is the bolt won't last forever. We could then do additional analysis to find out when the bolt fails and does it meet criteria. However, in arrow 3 through 7 one, we will just expect bolts to either be good for infinite life or they're not good at all. And we'll design for that. And one of the reasons that this is commonly done is because fasteners get used so much that basically uh, if they can't survive forever, it might just be better to redesign them. Okay. Um, there are two other checks we're going to do. One is the onset of yield. All that's doing is saying, hey, look, are we getting yielding when we are uh, under our max load? And so because of that, we could use FTY here, but uh, we're going to go ahead and follow Shigley's approach and use the proportional limit to evaluate that. So you'll notice that it's just the proportional limit divided by FM plus FA. That proportional limit is a stress that we got from our table where we got bolt strengths. And our FM plus FA is simply the max stress in disguise, okay? The other check we're gonna do is that separation of the joint check that we learned about last time, same equation, all right? So, that's basically our approach. The one thing we're missing is how to calculate the endurance limit. So we'll get to that next. So first, we need to look at what are the stress concentration factors that we see with bolts. And we already saw the three places where failures occur, the fillet and at the threads. And uh, this is a little table for grade, SAE grade bolt zero to M2. Uh, we have a stress concentration factor at the fillet. And then depending on whether we have rolled or cut threads, we have either a 2.2 or a 2.8 stress concentration factor. If we have a grade four to eight bolt, then these are our, you can see the factors there. And also it's cross mapped to metric grades, okay? Now obviously, uh, 
it's very cheap to make manufacture fasteners when you cut the threads on a CNC machine or a, excuse me like a screw machine and uh, but uh, they can be rolled but it's more cost so you should probably assume you have cut threads unless you have information showing that it's rolled in arrow 3271 to scan the problem if I say it's rolled thread you use the rolled thread number if it's a cut thread you use the cut thread number the only time you would use the fillet stress concentration factor since it's lower than the thread stress concentration factor is if I specifically ask you what uh, to, to give me an endurance limit based on that otherwise we'll take the highest one which basically is going to be the cut thread value unless we know we had rolled threads and it's the rolled thread value got it so now that we have the stress concentration factors I told you we're not going to apply those to the stresses we're going to apply them to the endurance limit and uh, I have developed a little simple equation which does this rather readily, recalling that our uh, endurance limit is roughly half of our um, FTU for steels. We will just use this form of the equation, 0.929 times 0.5 times FTU divided by whatever the max K sub T is that we find from our table 581. This does a fair job of... Uh, approximating the endurance limit and we will use that in arrow 3271 and you can also use that in industry if you don't have better data if you have a real critical joint you might want to go test and get your values all right so here's a stepwise system for evaluating fatigue then we only learned a couple new things and it's kind of a rehash of what we knew from fatigue before so you really should sketch your joint every time sketch out your cone angles Place all the pertinent dimensions. This will make it easier for you to nail it without making mistakes. Okay, you're then going to comp compute your bolt and member stiffnesses, as we talked about a couple times now. We're going to get our joint stiffness coefficient. We talked about that and calculate our uh, max and min external loads on the joint. We then use those and we uh, determine what our preload is going to be in the bolt, and then we can check for joint separation. For the bolt right following the same approach we learned before then we can write our margins for joint separation if we need to we can ca calculate our max and min bolt stresses as before making sure we're using the right bolt force with having accounted for that joint separation we then calculate our mean and alternating stresses we get our FTU and our F our proportion limit of the bolt and then we can calculate our endurance limit for the bolt. We then select our failure criterion and write our margin of safety against infinite life. And, uh, and then it's good to go and look at your numbers and see if they make sense. Okay. Here's a little example. This is actually using a couple little uh, details from uh, Shigley. But if we evaluate this bolt with a max load going from 2400 to zero, a preload of 2500 pounds, then this just shows factors of safety for the different uh, criterion that might be used. Then this uh, takes that data and it plots our uh, it plots our failure curve for the um, for the Goodman criteria, and you can kind of see okay, so this is our failure curve. It looks like we're well within the design envelope you can see our design point there in red now it's kind of hard to see here but if you look at uh, if you look carefully you can kind of see I, I drew a little uh, thing on here where basically we said okay let's start with zero preload if we have zero preload and we start loading with external load we're going to be coming along here like this from over here and we're going to be moving this way you see that and then uh, so as we add more and more preload, we basically, we start off with a negative margin if we had no preload and had this huge external load. But as we add preload, now less and less is being carried by the bolt. And so, uh, we're, but we're, uh, we're getting, but we're, uh, as we add preload, we have tiny amounts of preload, we actually end up gapping. So all we end up doing is adding preload to the bolt and we still have all the external load as well. 
at some point we get to the point where we have just enough preload to keep from gapping for the external load that we have. And then, and this is plotting our, uh, this is our average stress against our alternating stress. And this has a K on it because a little slightly different approach was followed. As soon as we get to that preload where we no longer, um, where we no longer uh, gap, where we retain, re, retain compression in the members, we go from, you can see since this is our failure criterion, and our point is out here, this was a gross negative margin. It was negative and it went even more negative. And then as soon as we get to the point, just enough preload in order to keep the joint in compression, our margin of safety drops from this negative value to down here, to highly, positive margin of safety. If we keep adding preload, we move this way. This was our actual design point, and then we keep moving this way until we eventually fail by passing our curve. So you can see that the preload had a very strong effect. Now the way we looked at that preload, we just plotted our average versus our alternating component against the failure criterion. And uh, and we see this was the effect of preloading. Now, normally when we're designing this, we don't want this point to be too close to the spot because if anything changes, we suddenly go to negative margin. So you kind of want to pump your uh, pump the preload up until you're out in here, maybe a little further this way, so you're not too close to it suddenly becoming negative, but also not too close to the failure criterion. So that's how it works. Another little thing we could do to understand this, this is plotting, uh, oh, and this is a graphic showing that. We're coming in here with no preload. We slowly increase the preload until we get a compressed joint at the full external load. Then our margin of safety drops down to this value. And if you keep increasing preload, all you do is you, that gets to our new mar our, our design point, and then you get more and more negative until you finally fail. Okay. Another way to look at this is here, this is plotting the factor of safety against that. And you can kind of see that we are going from uh, a factor of safety of less than one, which is unacceptable. It gets worse and worse as you add preload until you no longer gap. Then we pop up to this positive value and then we slowly decay our factor of safety as we add more and more preload. So that is how we evaluate fasteners for fatigue. If you uh, don't recall some of the building blocks that we started off assuming we knew, go back to lecture 12, study that out, then come back to this one. That should nail it for you. Enjoy.